Now, okay, the Spanish Inquisition is a term that rouses thoughts of torture and a fiery death. It is a term that sits uncomfortably with modern views of a God of love and acceptance of everyone, everyone, whatever their beliefs and life choices. While the Inquisition is largely used to describe the events in medieval Spain, the Roman Catholic institution to root out heresy started in France in 1184 and officially continues to this day in the Catholic Church under a different name. So this presentation will look at the reasons for the Inquisition, its victims, and compare it with the civil law and processes current at the time. So at speaker tonight is Stephen White, and he's had a career as a physicist and is now retired. So that's got nothing to do with history, um, but he's uh, taken on the uh, task quite willingly of doing his research and presenting what he's found. So he's been a very supportive member of Reasonable Faith Committee uh, for a number of years, and we're very glad to have him. So right now, I'm going to hand over to Stephen White. So thanks, Stephen. Okay, thanks so much, Kevin. I appreciate that. Um, as the introduction said, we talk about the Spanish Inquisition, and indeed, that was the original uh, title that I was supposed to be addressing tonight. But um, when you go, and as you do, go into start investigate a topic and you type it in, uh, the, the Total Inquisition was the first uh, website that I, I opened and started reading. So I actually are, and I am in fact going to describe the Inquisition uh, prior to the Spanish Inquisition and then continue it on uh, up till today. So we will talk about the Spanish Inquisition and that's most of what we'll be talking about. But uh, we will also allude to the others that uh, have also happened. <laughs> The Inquisition was a powerful uh, office set up by the Catholic Church. I'm actually going to just scroll you guys out of there so I can read my own slides. Uh, to root out and punish heresy throughout Europe and the Americas. Beginning in the 12th century and continuing for hundreds of years, the Inqu Inquisition is infamous for the severity of its tortures and its persecutions of Protestants, Jews and Muslims. Its worst manifestation was in Spain where the Spanish Inquisition was a dominant force for more than 200 years, resulting in some 32,000 executions. Uh, when Kevin and I did a dry run a few days ago, um, he did make the point there are other uh, estimates for the number of uh, people that were killed by the, uh, the Inquisition. But that is, broadly speaking, one of the more common um, uh, numbers mentioned for those that ended up losing their lives to the Inquisition. Yes, there are some people will say there's only a thousand or few or two. Others will go greater than that, uh, greater than the 32,000 I got there. But um, it's of that order. And uh, as like many things in history, that's one of those uh, numbers that can be debated. Let's get this out of the way again. Thomas Madden, the Real Inquisition and National Review, 2004, made the following comment. This is, I stumbled across this and I thought it was put, good to put it up there. The Inquisition was not born out of the desire to crush diversity or oppress people. It was rather an attempt to stop unjust executions. Yes, you read that correctly. Heresy was a crime against the state. <clears throat> Roman law in the Code of Justinian made it a capital offence that is, heresy was a capital offence. Rulers whose authority was believed to come from God had no patience for heretics. You can see the drawing there from uh, uh, from the scriptural reference that um, if the uh, head of the uh, the state was put there by God, then someone who was a heretical was in fact offending both God and should be punished by the state. Broadly speaking, then, these are the steps we'll be going through. We'll talk about the French Inquisition to start off with. We'll talk about the steps of an Inquisition. Uh, then we'll go to talk about those that were persecuted by the, uh, persecuted by the Spanish Inquisition and so on. But you can see them all there. Let's start in France. In 1884, Pope Lucius III sent bishops to southern France around the town of Albi, and I've got it marked on that map there, just a little bit north of Toulouse, to track down heretics called Catharists. And this uh, effort continued into the 14th century. The Inquisition against Catharists extended 
out of France into Aragon. Again, you can see that there on that particular uh, map that I've got there. Who were the Catholics? Well, they're a Gnostic sect of Christianity, which spread from over in the east, over towards the Byzantine side of the church. They did not believe his came in flesh. He was only a pure and holy God in the spirit. There is an equally powerful and evil God, Satan, who dwelt in the flesh. So there was some sexual license in this sect. In 1231, Pope Gregory charged the Dominican and Franciscan orders to take over the job of tracking down the heretics. So it's Dominicans and Franciscans that you've got to watch out for. So what would happen during an inquisition? Inquis inquis inquisitors would arrive in a town and announce their presence, giving citizens a chance to admit to heresy. Those who confessed received a punishment ranging from a pilgrimage to a whipping. Those accused of heresy were forced to testify. If the heretic did not confess, torture and execution were inescapable. Heretics weren't allowed to face their accusers, this is in the French version anyway, received no counsel and were often victims of false accusations. Bernard Guy wrote the influential guidebook for inquisitors called Conduct of the Inquisition into the Heretical Depravity. In the early 14th century, uh, that's when he wrote it, um, Yui himself pronounced over 600 people guilty of heresy. So he knew what he was talking about when he wrote the book. But besides uh, going after those that were perhaps doctrinally in, uh, incorrect in their spiritual sense, uh, King, King Philip IV of France wanted to destroy the Order of Knights Templar, perhaps more because of mercenary reasons. They had apparently denied the indebted ruler additional loans. In 1307, inquisitors were involved in a mass arrest of some 15,000 Knights Templar. Many of the Knights were brutally tortured until they confessed to false charges, which included heresy, homosexuality, financial corruption, devil worshiping, fraud, spitting on the cross and more. A few years later, dozens of the Templars were burned at the stake in Paris for their confessions. The head of their order was executed in 1314. Under pressure from the uh, King Philip, Pope Clement V reluctantly dissolved the Knights Templar in 1312. The group's pro property and monetary assets were given to a rival order, the Knights Hospital Orders. However, it is thought that King Philip and also King Edward II of England seized most of the Knights Templar's wealth. There is another famous character we should mention in, in relationship to the uh, French Inquisition. Joan of Arc, burned at the stake in 1431, is the most famous victim of the French wing of the Inquisition. Joan convinced the embattled uh, crown prince, I think he was called the Dauphin, uh, Charles of Valois, to allow her to lead a French army to the besieged city of Orleans where it achieved a momentous victory over the English and their allies, the Burgundians. After seeing the prince crowned, King Charles VII, Joan was captured by the Anglo-Burgundian forces, tried for witchcraft and heresy, and burned at the stake at the age of 19. I think most of us know or have heard of Joan of Arc. As well, uh, abuse of power, wherever you get the ability to charge people, then yes, abuse of power uh, generally follows. King, uh, Count rather, Count Raymond the Seventh of Toulouse was known for burning heretics to the state, even though they had confessed. And his successor, Count Alphonse, Alf, Alphonse, confiscated the lands of the accused to increase his riches. Okay, so that's a quick trot through the French Inquisition. Now let's turn to the Spanish Inquisition. Let's see, I want to um, look at medieval Spain, just to paint the picture. Indeed, is a, is actually quite um, surprising that the Inquisition did in fact take root in Spain. Compared with Northern Europe uh, nations, the Iberian kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, Andalusia and Granada were known for their interreligious tolerance between Catholics, Muslims and Jews, as each race depended on each other for mutual prosperity. Aragon had laws to protect minorities, for example, crusaders 
uh, attacking Jewish or Muslim subjects of the King of Aragon while on their way to fight in the reconquest were punished with death by hanging. Whereas England and France carried out murderous pur purges of the Jews as they were scapegoats for the Black Death and Muslims were hated following the Crusades. So medieval Spain was quite tolerant of these other uh, minority religions. England and France were often at war with each other uh, and often their central rule was challenged by the barons, whereas English kings were generally stronger. Thus their kingdoms and commerce was more stable. So there's every reason in one sense, why rock the boat in Spain? Northern Europe countries though, regarded Spanish kingdoms with disdain for their acceptance of the mixed cultures. Just a reminder then, this is, you saw that uh, same map before, just uh, giving an over geographic overview. We have um, Castile in the central part and the, the northern part of Spain. We have Granada, uh, the actual still Muslim part at that stage of um, Spain. And of course, with the main Muslim dynasties down there in North Africa. Aragon was over towards the east and spread. And as, you, as I said, during the French Inquisition, it wasn't far from Albi where the French Inquisition started. Not only that, Aragon actually controlled much of the Corsica, the islands um, there, and then also to southern Italy. So Aragon really was a large uh, kingdom at that stage. Portugal, though, was independent. Now let's look at the powers that be, Isabel and Ferdinand, the first and Ferdinand the second. Isabel was born in 1451. She was third in line at that stage, the Castilian throne. The much older brother, Henry IV, became king, but squandered much of, their, his, of his inherited wealth and let crime increase. In other words, he was not a competent king. Even though Henry tried to marry Isabel off to Portuguese, then French and British royals for political gain, she refused as she'd been betrothed secretly to Ferdinand of Navarre since the age of six. Uh, by the way, Navarre is actually part of Aragon. Isabel eloped and married Ferdinand in 1469, so she would have been 18 years at that stage. In 1474, about five years later, Henry IV died and Isabel was selected to rule. She reacquired royal lands to ensure regular income and regulated the local guards to stop crime. In other words, she was a much stronger ruler than had been Henry IV. Portugal was growing wealthy from its monopoly of trade with Africa and the new route to the East Indies around the, the, well, where Vasco da Gama went around South Africa. So Isabella and Henry commissioned a man called Christopher Columbus, you probably know, to find a westerly route to the East Indies. He sailed across the Atlantic and he found America instead, which was even more profitable. There you go. Now let's talk about her husband. King Ferdinand II, formerly Crown Prince of Aragon, was the inspiration for Machiavelli, Machiavelli's The Prince. So if you ever think of someone who's Machiavellian, he's the original character. Aragon included the Kingdom of Naples and thus Southern Italy, and I showed that on the previous map. Italy was weak and divided, but Spain was strong and united. So that's why Machiavelli admired him. Ferdinand became king of United Spain from 1474 when, of course, Isabel took the throne. After gathering the best soldiers and cannon from Europe, Ferdinand and Isabel finally conquered the last Islamic emirate in Spain, Granada, in 1492 after 10 years of war. So, given what I said before, why did they launch the Spanish Inquisition? Spain, by and large at that stage, was doing okay as a multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious uh, kingdom. Well, maybe there were philosophical and religious reasons. I'm gonna give a few uh, suggested reasons. Ferdinand was described by Machiavelli as a man who didn't even know the meaning of piety, but who made political use of it for national unity. <laughs> There's, uh, that's a Machiavellian for you. Then another theory, the two multi-religious hypothesis, popular envy of many successful Jews and some Muslims who mixed with the Catholic majority. Uh, in other words, there was jealousy between other religions. 
of the other people with a different religion. Enforcement across the border. Merging Castile and Aragon required consistent rules across both of those um, now United Kingdom. And the only local power that was common to both of them was the Catholic Church. The Ottoman scare hypothesis. Plots by Moriscos, which are Muslims forcibly converted to Catholic, may have been gathering to support a possible Ottoman invasion. Just a reminder, at that time in history, the Ottoman Empire, uh, particularly with its uh, ruling navy, was able to stretch its power right across the Mediterranean, right away from, from Turkey, where, of course, we now think of the, the Ottomans um, coming from. But they were actually had a navy that stretched right across the uh, Mediterranean, often would threaten Italy and other countries. The another th hypothesis, placate Europe. With the rise of France and the Ottomans, Spain needed alliances with other Euro European powers. So they needed to overcome its dirty blood image. In other words, it's uh, the fact that it was compromising itself by allowing the Jews and the Muslims to coexist peacefully with the Catholics. And finally, keeping the Pope in check hypothesis. They could launch their own inquisition before the Pope launched his in the realm, right? with his grab for more power coming along with it. So if they get in ahead of the Pope, then they'd be able to keep his um, influence out. Remember in those days, the Popes most certainly did have an interest in being able to control the nations uh, in their particular, you know, in that particular area. So <coughs> now let's go on to the, uh, the, the who were persecuted. Firstly, it was the Jews. Known as conversos, they were viewed with suspicion by the old powerful Christian families who, who blamed conversos for plagues, poisoning people's water and abducting Christian boys. Ferdinand and Isabel were afraid of angering these Christian subjects who demanded a harder line against the conversos. Christian support was crucial in the upcoming crusade against the Muslims planned in Granada. Ferdinand felt an inquisition was the best way to fund that crusade uh, and by seizing the wealth of heretic conversos. The inquisition had no mandate against Jews or Muslims who retained their faith. They could only, those could only be tried by the king. So let's look at who took charge of the Spanish inquisition. In 1478, this is when the Spanish Inquisition begins, under the influence of a converso Dominican priest, no, one of their own converso, Thomas de Torquemada, the Tribunal of Castile was formed to investigate the heresy among the conversos. The effort first focused on stronger Catholic education for the conversos, but by 1480, the Inquisition was formed. Evidence that was used to identify a crypto Jew, now by the term a crypto Jew, meaning someone who was secretly a Jew, included the absence of chimney smoke on Saturdays, a sign a family might be secretly honouring the Sabbath, the buying of many vegetables before Passover, remembering that vegetables are kosher, and the purchase of meat from a converted butcher, a sign of secret kosher adherence. Thomas Torquemada um, died, uh, no, sorry, starting again. In 1485, an inquisitor died after being poisoned. Another inquisitor under Thomas's um, leadership was stabbed to death in the church. Torquemada managed to round up the assassins, burning at stake 42 people in retaliation. His downfall, however, came when he investigated members of the clergy for heresy. Complaints to the Pope at the time, Alexander VI convinced him that Torquemada needed to be tempered. He was starting to get a little bit out of control. So Torquemada was forced to share the leadership with four other clergymen until he died in 1498. Let's go further into the history of the Inquisition against the Jews. The most intense period for persecution lasted until 1530. Remember, it started about 40 years earlier. By 1560, the percentage of conversos among the Inquisition had dropped to about only 3% of the total. In 1588, though, 
a group, a group, sorry, a group of crypto Jews was discovered in uh, Catalan de la Orden, and there was a rise in denunciations of conversos in the last decade of that century. At the beginning of the 17th century, some conversos who had fled uh, to Portugal began to return to Spain, fleeing the persecution of the Portuguese Inquisition found in 1536. They went on trial. Between, uh, they were between a rock and a hard place. In 1691, Cheetahs uh, or Conversos of Mallorca were burnt. Just for, again, where Kevin and I discussed it. Mallorca is one of the uh, now it's actually a tourist island in the Mediterranean, but um, there was a persecution there on one of those Mediterranean islands. Manuel Santiago Vivar was tried in Cordoba in in 1818. Was the last person tried for being a crypto Jew. So there you go continued all the way through until only just about 200 years ago. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, one final um, summary of then what was, <laughs> this is a very um, inappropriate term to use, the final solution for the Jews in Spain uh, was um, after the orthodoxy was eventually inadequate, they were then banished from Spain. The main justification Monica gave for formally expelling all Jews, which is the Alhambra degree, was the great harm suffered by Christians, Christian conversos, from the contact, intercourse, and communication which they had with the Jews, who always attempt in various ways to seduce, seduce the faithful Christians from our holy Catholic faith. That's the summary of that uh, Alhambra degree. So yes, expelling them became the uh, final um, not going to use that final solution. That's too bad a term. Uh, that became what happened. <clears throat> now, I did mention a couple of slides or three slides ago that if you continue to be um, practice your faith, either as a Muslim or as a Jew, you could not be subject to the Inquisition. However, Jews who refused to convert or leave Spain were called heretics and could be burned to death at the stake. So, there was a catch 22 on that. Okay, you could retain your faith and you were not subject to the Inquisition, supposedly, but in the end, you could be captured and burned. So what was the process of the Inquisition in Spain? We have edicts of grace, we have detention, we have trial, torture, sentencing and punishment, and then the auto de fe, the big uh, ceremony that wrapped it all up, and that's, one of the auto FAs that you can see there is the background picture. Edicts of Grace. At the Sunday Mass, after the Inquisition team arrived in a city, the Inquisitor would proceed to read the edict. It explained possible heresies, heresies rather, and encouraged all the congregation to come to the tribunal of the Inquisition to relieve their consciences. Big revival meeting. They were called Edicts of Grace because all of the self-incriminated who presented themselves with a period, within a period of grace, usually 30 to 40 days, were offered the possibility of reconciliation with the church without severe punishment. Many voluntary presented themselves to the Inquisition were often encouraged uh, to denounce others who had also committed offences, informants being the Inquisition's primary source of information. After about 1500, Edicts of grace were replaced with edicts of faith, which left out the grace period, instead encouraged you to dob in anyway. Denunciations were anonymous and the defendants had no way of knowing the identity of their accusers. Now I'm just going to go briefly then on to the next stage, detention. After a denunciation, the case was examined by Califasadores, I'm sorry my Spanish is not that good, who had to determine if a heresy was involved, followed by the detention of the accused. In practice, many were detained in preventative custody, on remand in other words, and many cases of lengthy incarcerations occurred, lasting up to two years before these guys examined the case. So you could be stuck in jail for quite a while. A while. Not only that, Detention of the accused entailed sequestration of their property by the Inquisition. In other words, you are paying for your jailing. The property of the prisoner was used to pay for the procedural expenses and the accused own maintenance and costs. 
Often the relatives of the defendant found themselves in outright misery, poverty, of course. This situation was remedied only following instructions written in 1561. So what happened at the trial? Now, this is where I'm going to actually start to get a little bit more um, changing the theme to think, uh, to say just actually, this was not such a bad institution. The archives of the Inquisition are striking in the completeness of their documentation. The fairness of Inquisitional tribunals seemed to be among the best in early modern Europe when it came to the trial of, of laymen. However, some prisoners recorded the fairness was less than ideal when national or political interests were involved. The Inquisition process consisted of a series of hearings in which the denouncers and the defendant gave testimony, perhaps not together, but at least everyone had to have their day in court. A defence counsel was assigned to the defendant, who was a member of the tribunal itself, whose role was simply to advise the defendant and to encourage them to speak the truth, which probably is not a bad thing anyway. The, pros the prosec prosecution was directed by a man called the fiscal. Uh, interrogation of the defendant was done in the presence of the notor a notary of the secreto, who meticulously wrote down the words of the accused. In other words, you're at least being recorded for what you said. Uh, now we get to the nasty bit. Torture was employed in all civil and religious trials in Europe. The Spanish Inquisition was no exception. The Inquisition had a very strict regulations uh, regarding when, what, and to whom, and how many times, and for how long, and under what supervision it could be applied. When? Only when sufficient proof to confirm the culpability of the accused had already been gathered by other means, and every other method of negotiation had been tried and exhausted. In other words, you, at this stage, you're really only just trying to uh, get the guy to say the truth. Confessions obtained through torture could not be used to convict or sentence anyone. So you know, there was a limit on what torture could be used for. What, it was prohibited to maim, mutilate, draw blood, or cause any sort of permanent damage. Uh, okay, someone's getting his uh, toes uh, nice and roasted down there, but um, not much more than that could be done. <clears throat> and in fact, you could only do it up to two, between two and eight times, just depending on the crime. So again, there was a limit. You just couldn't keep doing it. How long? 15 minutes maximum. Romans Inquisition was 30 minutes. So um, you see the Spanish Inquisition actually did have a, you know, quite a, a strict limit on how long you could be tortured for. And finally, supervision. A doctor was on call. So in many respects, the, we hear so much about the torture, but, but um, the actual limits on it were, were quite actually strict. Now, the only other comment I'd make here was the Spanish Inquisition engaged in, far, uh, in, in torture, that is, far less often and with greater care than other civil courts. So that just puts a slight, you know, somewhat different complexion than perhaps the popular our popular um, view and account of what the Inquisition, Spanish Inquisition was all about. Now let's talk, look at uh, sentencing and punishment. The defendants could be acquitted. A rare outcome, that, of course, but uh, as it was a rare outcome, as inquisitors did not wish to terminate proceedings. The trial could be suspended, in which case the defendant, although under suspicion, went free. The threat, the process could be continued at any time or was held in long-term in prison until the trial commenced. The defendant could be penanced. <clears throat> Since they were considered guilty, they had to publicly repent their crimes, accept a public punishment, and among these were exile, fines, or sentencing to service as oarsmen in the royal galleys. <clears throat> Brings back memories of Les Miserables and, of course, Jean Valjean, who had to serve in the, the galleys for his crime, though albeit not in a religious sense. <clears throat> The defendant could be reconciled in addition to the public ceremony uh, in which the condemned was sentenced with the, with the Catholic Church, more severe punishments were used, among them long sentence to jail on the galaxies, plus confiscation of all property and physical punishments such as whipping were also used. But the most serious punishment was relaxation to the secular arm. 
uh, these strange terms, relaxation, you think it's going to be easy, but in fact, it means uh, passing over to the, uh, to the king and his authority. The Inquisition had no power to actually kill the convict or to determine the way in which he should die. That was the right of the king. Burning at the stake was frequently applied to impenitent heretics and those who had relapsed. Execution was public. If the condemned repented, they were shown mercy by being garroted before their court was burned, the corpse was burned. If not, they were burned alive. And of course, a, a bit of a, uh, a hark back to the way uh, Jesus was tried first by the Sanhedrin, but because they, of course, had no right for the capital punishment, they had to pass him on to um, Pilate to actually uh, give that ultimate sentence. Just a reminder, this is a scene, and here is one of the galleys. So you might end up rowing one of these. Probably heard the joke uh, about uh, the galley slaves one day. They, uh, there's a slave master on board, came, uh, came on board and said, well, good news, uh, it's a public holiday, but there's bad news. The captain wants to go water skiing. Right, so... Auto da fe, what is the auto da fe? The ceremony of auto da fe solemnized the, the accused return to the church or punishment as an impenitent heretic. They could be private or public, but over time they became a festive public event. The auto da fe involved a Catholic mass, prayer, a public procession of those found guilty. And here's the uh, painting showing the guys with their dancers caps on. Uh, being paraded between all these uh, witnesses, the people all looking on. And they took place in public squares or esplanades and lasted several hours. Ecclesiastical and civil authorities attended. You can see some pretty flash looking people around watching what's going on. Now let's turn, we've, we've dealt with the Jewish persecution. We've talked about the way that a, a, the Spanish Inquisition was conducted. Now let's turn now to the Moriscos. You may remember they were Muslims who had been converted, often under duress. Muslims in Granada, remember that was the final, oh, I'll just go back one. <clears throat> remember that um, Muslims in Granada, um, Muslim, Muslim, Granada rather was the last of the Emirates on the European mainland. Uh, and that's where they were then um, Granada was conquered by Isabel and by uh, Ferdinand. Many Moriscos were suspected of practicing in Islam in secret, but the way they guarded their domestic lives prevented the verification of the suspicion in most cases. Initially, they were not severely persecuted by the Inquisition, experiencing instead a policy of evangelization, a policy not followed with those conversos who were suspected of being crypto Jews. In other words, the Muslim converts were actually getting off somewhat lighter than the Jews. Moriscos had also integrated into Spanish society better than the Jews. And in the kingdoms of Valencia and Aragon, a large number of the Moriscos were under the jurisdiction and protection of nobility. I might throw in something that I didn't actually put in there, it just occurred to me. Of course, for well, from the teaching of the church, it was the Jews who crucified Christ. Uh, so that was that extra, perhaps, black mark against them that meant that they were probably had a, a, a further degree of um, infamy attached to them because of that. Moriscos and the Inquisition continuing then. The War of Al Pajaris from 1568 to 71 it was a general Muslim and Risca uprising in Granada that expected to aid the Ottoman disembark disembarkation in the peninsula, in other words, an invasion from the Ottoman Empire. But it ended in the forced dispersal of about half of the region's Moriscos throughout Castile and Andalusia, as well as the increased suspicion by Spanish authorities against this community. Between 1560 and 1571, 82% of those accused were Moriscos, who were a vast majority of Granada's population at the time. So as you can see, the trend is now away from the Jews and now from on to more onto the uh, Muslim converts. 
But again, Maurice Coase did not experience the same harshness uh, as conversos and Protestants, and the number of capital punishments was proportionately less. In 1609, King Philip III decreed the expulsion of Moriscos. In other words, much as the uh, uh, decree of Alhambra um, somewhat earlier. The last mass persecution, or prosecution rather, against Moriscos for crypto uh, Islamic practice occurred in Granada in 1727, with most of these convicts receiving relatively light sentences. By the end of the 18th century, in other words, about 1800, the um, indigenous practice of Islam was considered to have been effectively extinguished in Spain. So you might say, therefore, that the Inquisition had achieved its purpose. Now, we've talked about the Jews, we've talked about the uh, Muslims. Now, let's look at the others who were persecuted and put on trial. Protestants, that's obviously one of the others. A number of Anabaptists had been tried early in the Inquisition. Trials against Lutheran groups took place uh, at, you know, as the Reformation spread through Europe uh, in 1558 and in 1562 in the, in the region by Philip II. Trials signalled a notable intensification of the Inquisition's activities. Around 100 executions took place. Thereafter, Protestant trials diminished along again with the Protestant faith in Spain. In other words, once again, um, it was having the, correct, the desired effect. Witchcraft. Okay, in 1610, six people were burned, another five burned in effigy for witchcraft. Witch hunts were far less in Spain than some other European countries. And of course, most of us remember the stories of the Salem witch trials over in um, what now is the US. Blasphemy. Denial of transubstantiation and Mary's virginity were capital charges leading to harsh punishment. Uh, there's a picture of 14 Protestants burned at the stake in May 1559. And uh, as I prepared this, I remembered actually reading about the Inquisition. Some of you may have read Fox's Book of Martyrs and the first section of it um, leading up to his main theme, which is what happened in England under Queen Mary. Uh, but he does introduce leading up to Queen Mary uh, talks about the persecution that happened during the uh, Inquisition. In fact, the original title of Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, was Acts and Monuments of These Latter and Perilous Days Touching Matters of the Church. So yes, if you wanted to read a historic account, then please read John Fox's account in one of the more famous books in the Protestant uh, 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 list of the library. Other cases tried by the Inquisition, you had sodomy. The first settlement was burned by the Inquisition in Valencia in 1572. Recorded accusations included 90% clergy, 6% nobles, 37% workers, and 19% servants, and 18% soldiers and sailors. That's of those, not, not of the total of the clergy, but rather the breakdown of those being charged with sodomy. That's the percentage who they uh, their actual roles were. And most comprised older males with adolescents. So in that respect, I would have to say, it is actually not against about consenting males, but rather pedophilia, which even today, of course, is regarded as a crime. Freemasonry. I'm not sure if any of you know the secret handshake, but the Roman Catholic Church regarded um, Freemasonry as heretic, heretical since about 1738. The suspicion of Freemasonry was potentially a capital offence. Uh, Spanish Inquisition records revealed two prosecutions in Spain and a few throughout the Spanish Empire. Okay, so in that last comment I made on the previous slide mentioned the Spanish Empire. From his coronation in uh, 1556, Philip II brought the Inquisition to the Netherlands, where Lutherans were hunted down and burned at the stake. Spain established the Inquisition in Mexico in 1570. And in 1574, Lutherans were burned at the stake there. The Inquisition came to Peru, where Protestants were likewise tortured and burned alive. Okay, well, that now completes what I had to say on the Spanish Inquisition. Now I'm going on briefly to look at the Roman Inquisition. 
Rome renewed its own inquisition in 1542 when Paul, uh, Pope Paul III created the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Roman and Universal Inquisition to combat Protestant heresy. Notice this one's aimed at those of us who are Protestants. This inquisition is best known for putting Galileo on trial in 1633. Um, I remember Len Long uh, did actually lead us through that prosecution probably four years ago now, I think. Now let's talk about the end of the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, I've jumped into Rome, but now I'm just going back to Spanish Inquisition briefly. In 1808, um, Napoleon conquered Spain and ordered the Spanish Inquisition there to be abolished. So Napoleon who, who squashed it. After Napoleon's defeat in 1814 in Waterloo, uh, Ferdinand VII worked to reinstate the Inquisition, that's uh, it's Ferdinand, the, the King of Spain, but he was prevented by the French government, which had just helped Ferdinand overcome a rebellion. So part of the agreement with France was to dismantle the Inquisition, which was defunct by 1834. Indeed, the very last person to be executed by the Inquisition was Cayanatano Rapol, a Spanish schoolmaster hanged for heresy in 1826. The Supreme Sacred Congregation of Rain at Rome, of the Roman and Universal Inquisition still exists, though it changed its name a couple of times. It's currently called the Congregation for the Doctrines of the Faith. So it's still there, it's still there. Now I'm just going to say, look, we do as a Christian church have quite a bad reputation because of the Inquisition. People can turn to and point how cruel we were, but I'm just going to remind you of other things that have happened, other persecutions. We talked about the Spanish Inquisition, roughly 30,000 odd um, killings over about 200 years. Now let's just look at some of the other things that have happened in our time. First of all, the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge. As a reminder, one to two million people, or Approximately, somewhat over 20% of the whole Cambodian and Khmer population were killed in just four years, 1975 to 1979. You can see that row of skulls. You could go today and see the museums in um, the Khmer Republic and see the skulls that resulted from that mass killing. Um, Mao Zedong himself. Now, we obviously, this is very political these days, but just a reminder. As a historian um, and his wife, um, uh, John Haldane, in 2005, did some detailed research of just how many people were killed by the communist regime in China. Up to 70 million Chinese were killed in post-revolutionary purges. Then, in the Great Leap Forward, mass starvation, government ordained, and finally, the Cultural Revolution, where, yeah, very hard to estimate, but uh, one, Estimate from, in fact, uh, the Holocaust uh, Foundation estimates between five and 10, 10, 10 million people killed during the Cultural Revolution. The Holodomor, I have a friend at church, an 85 year old guy who walks with a, uh, with a limp. He's, he's actually suffered from, di um, from vitamin deficiency. He was born in the Ukraine in 1933 and still suffers from the uh, vitamin deficiency that occurred when something like five million U Ukrainians were killed under a government ordained um, seizure of grain. Yes, and then there's the Holocaust. I think we all know about that. The French Revolution, 2,500 were executed during the reign of terror in only two years. Yes, it's not as much as the, uh, uh, the total for the uh, um, Inquisition, Spanish Inquisition, but note, this was only over two years. And then just a comparison, I don't want to blow it all on the revolution because back in the Paris Commune in 1870, some 20,000 men, women and children were massacred by the uh, anti-revolutionary forces. Uh, they marched into Paris and killed, as I say, men, women and children. There's one of the um, photos taken back in those days of men about to be shot as they, uh, because they were on the wrong side. So that's my presentation of the Inquisition. It's comparison uh, with the civil 
code of the day, and of course, in comparison with the sort of bloodshed that we apparent well, we seem to overlook uh, in more recent times. Uh, thank you, Kevin. That's uh, what I had to say. I can't hear you. Yeah, I think you're muted. Yeah, I, I've unmuted myself now. Thank you. So that, thanks for that, Steve. It was very informative. I found it very interesting. Um, there's a, just um, um, a question I had. You mentioned Justinian, <coughs> Justinian <coughs> in the first slide. Yes. So uh, he was a Roman emperor, wasn't he? He was, yes, that's right. Yes. And so how far back was he? Well, he was a, bus, uh, back, uh, he was a Byzantine um, emperor, and Justinian. In fact, he was one of the more famous emperors that conquered uh, back in Italy, he actually threw some of the, um, the Goths and the Vandals out. But uh, I think he'd be around about 500 yeah. AD, something of that order, maybe 600, but he was uh, fairly famous for his ability to... Uh, reconquer some of the lost territories. Yeah, so he, <coughs> he was the one who said that heresy was a capital offence. That's that right? correct, that's right, and put it in the road of uh, the code of what would then be a Byzantine justice. Right, okay. So, so at that point you kind of had a strong connection between church and state, that, yes. that um, Christianity was the religion of the empire, and so <coughs> everybody was expected to be a Christian who was in the Roman Empire. Yes, well, Romans 13 is, I think, where he would have based his, um, uh, yeah, the, the biblical basis for making that true. Mm. All right, uh, Brian's got a question here. How was Joan of Arc connected to the French Inquisition? Okay, um, it, she was tried under the code of law that said she was a witch. Now, it is tr it's true, she was not a Catharist, so a Catharist, but she was regarded as being a heretic because, uh, uh, look, I'd have to look into it. And in fact, I invite uh, those that might be interested to look up at the faith. But I do recall, I think it might have been a movie or maybe a, even a radio adaptation of um, her life. But certainly she was regarded as not walking strictly in accordance with church doctrine. Because after all, who would say that a 19-year-old girl at that uh, had the authority to command an army. I, I suspect she was regarded as being a heretic because of her position as a woman and indeed because of her age and uh, and a bit like some of the other prosecutions that happened during the French time, they probably bent the meaning of heresy a bit, but they certainly tried her on that basis. Mm -hmm. Now, in one of your slides, you came up with um, several hypotheses about yes. the reason for the origin. Yes. So, um, which is very balanced, you gave them all, but which, uh, what do you actually think is... Um... Well, look, I, I honestly don't know. <laughs> well, I, I guess I think, I actually, when I first wrote them out, the one that is on, currently on the top was what was down towards the bottom, but I, I put that at the top because uh, I have to have a wry smile that uh, Machiavelli would have probably regarded that as the most, um, yeah, as, as the most reasonable. Basically, um, Ferdinand II, uh, well, what's a good excuse? Um, I'll call it uh, piety. That's not really the reason. I'm just going to do it because I want to, because I want to achieve power. Um, joining uh, Aragon with uh, Castile, and I will go ahead and do it because I can. And what is that also acquiring property? Well, more or less, really demonstrating his rule. Um, because, I, look, I, I, I have to be honest, I've never read The Prince, but I've heard many quotes from him. I've read the uh, summary of it. Uh, it's about using anything, to, uh, anything it means at your disposal to maintain power. Hmm. Yeah, I've read it. It was given to me as a, um, a gift when I left um, in my employment in Brisbane. <laughs> and headed to work for British Aerospace, uh, <laughs> BAE Systems. He thought I'd need it there. <laughs> um, yes. Okay, um, let's see. Um, what does garroted mean? Okay, all right. Um, I don't know, someone might correct me here, but it is basically a very quick strangulation with a bit of wire that cuts straight through your throat. And you, yes, you lose, um, it, it's, a, it's a, almost a wire version of beheading. Right, okay. And so that was considered uh, more merciful than um, having somebody burned. 
Well, it, yeah, a lot, well, we, I guess we can all envisage that being burnt at the stake lasts for some minutes, of, of, whereas a garroting lasts a very, you know, it's a few seconds worth of having a, a throat and uh, sliced through. Right, very nice. Um, all right, so uh, we, we um, uh, like Protestants, kind of focus on um, um, persecution of the Protestants by the Catholic yes. Church in Spain. Yes. But was um, prosecution of Protestants relatively minor compared with other groups? Yes, well, it, it certainly is the emphasis and the Spanish Inquisition. Um, certainly the Jews were the major uh, focus of early persecution and overall were the main victims. Uh, and it's very interesting that even John Fox, the writer of Fox's Book of Martyrs, does give an account of the execution. In fact, it's a very, almost a very touching scene in which uh, the King of Spain is seated on his throne and a beautiful Jewish girl is brought before him. And um, even though she pleads for her life, the uh, king says, no, 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 you've been found out to be a, a false converso and he said to, to the uh, uh, to the flames and you know he, within John Fox he's this English guy writing from a very Protestant perspective during the reign of um, Queen Mary and um, trying to record all the horrors that happened to the, the Protestants um, that he does in fact um, not just let the Protestants being the only victims he does remind us that the Jews um, in this particular case a very poignant and uh, touching scene of this young Jewish woman who was sent to the flames. Yeah, so it almost sounds as though the um, persecution of Protestants was actually worse in England than what it was in Spain. Yes, yes. That, I mean, later on, of course, and by the time we get to the Americas and so on, yes, the Protestants become the main source of victims. And as you, I did say in the slides, the Inquisition did have a, an effect. It essentially it, it achieved its aim by, first of all, having the Jews expelled, uh, or um, removed there, and then indeed the uh, Muslims, but indeed then in turn, even in Spain, the Protestants thought it's no good sticking around and they left as well. Oh, okay. Um, now, Dr. Rodney, uh, as many political regimes killed many more um, than during the various inquisitions instigated in the name of the church, does this make fewer killings more acceptable? Should we not expect more from the church? Oh, uh, okay. Thanks, Doctor. <laughs> um, now, look, it was just to make the point, we, we are quite rightly condemned as, as Christians because of, the, because of what happened during the uh, uh, Inquisition. Yes, it happened. No, we can't deny that. But at the same time, I, I feel certainly, I mean, I, I think most of us will have experienced the uh, have heard the phrase, oh, you know, the church is responsible, religion rather, that's the, perhaps put in a broader sense, religion is responsible for most of the uh, wars and uh, the deaths in society. Religion should be banned because it's caused so much trouble. It's not actually true, actually. No, it isn't. And that's why I wanted to remind people by those last three or four slides, look what's happened, guys. You know, the Khmer Rouge. That was nothing to do with Christianity. It was all about Marxism. Or Mao Zedong, Stalin. Yeah, exactly. All of that. So for all those reasons... Um, Hitler. Yeah, Hitler. That's right. So all those things were conducted without a Christian basis. And yet so often it is thrown in our faces. Oh, you know, religion is the cause of most of the wars, uh, most of the deaths and, and troubles in the world. All right. There's I mean, a... I think it shows the... Uh, the full nature of humanity generally, uh, regardless of what ideology someone yes. has. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, look, and okay, so my topic today was the Inquisition. Uh, I still, though, would point out that the 30 year war in Europe back in about, was it 16, 30, sorry, was, was between nominally Catholic and nominally Protestant uh, armed forces, and they ravaged Germany in particular, and Oh, I don't know. It was the most horrible war in Europe, probably for uh, well ever, um, because I don't think it. Yeah, it certainly 
it was a bit like what the uh, Khmer Rouge did in, in um, Cambodia. It certainly killed a huge proportion of the population. Yeah, I've been thinking of that as a future topic for you, uh, Steve. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and last question on the chat is, um, what is the, uh, from Gordon is, what is the present day Muslim view of the Inquisition? Oh, I do apologize. I did not look into that. Um, no, I, I can't say that. Uh, I don't know. Um, I think I, it'd be rather hard for them to point the finger because they've got their own inquisitions and um, brutality as well. Of course they do. Yes, of course they do. I, you know, I mean, I, I think we all acknowledge that, uh, uh, is it Al-Qaeda? Certainly its ultimate aim is to re, uh, reconquer the original um, empire uh, or caliphates uh, that they were in Muslim and Spain is regarded at least by the fundamentalist um, Islamic, Islamic uh, leaders that uh, that includes reconquering Spain. Yeah, but that's um, that's not an answer to the topic. Sorry, that's <laughs> getting away from it. But uh, because the Inquisition was, of course, about yeah uh, persecuting those that were not of the Catholic faith. The reason I mention this is that uh, the Muslims, even uh, moderate Muslims, are often going on about uh, the injustice of the Crusades. Yes. Uh, but I've never heard them actually talk about the injustice of the Inquisition. I'm just wondering why. Oh. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yes, look, good point, Gordon. I, I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll let you perhaps delve into it. Um, you know, the internet these days does give various views and uh, uh, it could well be that they do have a view on the Inquisition. Okay. I suspect that they probably don't have a strong view on it because they weren't, well, Muslims were not greatly affected by it. No, no, they weren't, no. But ultimately, they were expelled, even as the Jews were. Also, from an Islamic perspective, um, Islam is always correct. It is always right. So anything they do has to be right. Mm -hmm. And anything that is therefore done against them, by definition, has to be wrong and evil. Uh, yes. So any aspect of the Inquisition that affected Muslims and Islam uh, would have to be very badly looked upon, irrespective of what Muslims may do at any other time, because... Yes. They're doing it for the right reasons. We would have done it for the wrong reasons. Exactly. Yes. From their perspective. Yes. Now, thanks for that, Brian. Of course, we as Christians can now look, I mean, well, hopefully we're honest enough to say, no, that was not really right. We shouldn't have done that. Hmm. Yes. In answer to uh, Rodney's question earlier, should we not expect more from the church? Absolutely. Yes. I think we'd all agree with that. I think we'd actually, uh, in viewing it, we'd say that um, this is not consistent with <coughs> what Christ teaches. But um, like, how did they manage to, if that's correct, then how did they manage to rationalise it in the light of Christ's teaching? Well, it is, uh, as I think it goes right back to what Justinian, um, his code of law, that if, if you do take uh, Romans 13 as something that we should apply in our lives, then God has ordained the spiritual leaders to, uh, sorry, the, the secular leaders of our society to be in the positions they are to uh, regulate society. And if someone um, therefore is heretical, they're actually undermining God's control and therefore the secular power's control of society. Note, for instance, that they, the Inquisition would not of itself uh, actually do, would not actually give the sentences. That was done by the secular authorities. All they could do is, yes, we have found this person guilty of heresy. Now, um, Your Majesty, over to you. What do you want to do? Yeah, it still gives them a lot of power, nevertheless. It does, yes, it does, yes. And you can see, as I mentioned in the French Inquisition, uh, yes, power corrupted uh, some of those nobles who would uh, uh, bias the uh, outcome to uh, for acquisition, uh, acquisitiveness and greed, yeah. Hmm. 
And so how did they relate that to their Christian faith? Well, obviously they didn't really have much Christian faith, so That's therefore right. that was irrelevant. Yeah. That, exactly, yes, yes, exactly. I mean, if, if, if the powers that be accept your recommendation, that gives you a lot of power. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. But for what it's worth, I'm just reading through the book of Amos at the moment. And the more things change, the more they change, stay the same. Um, you read what was happening in the ancient kingdom of Israel, the, the northern kingdom, and uh, exactly the same. Corruption, uh, the, the uh, what's the right word, the um, greed in which the uh, you oppressed the poor people to gain as much as you could uh, acquire by yourself. Um, and so, yes, what we see happening, the corruption in the Inquisition, is exactly what happened in ancient Israel as well. Well, it's open for it now. You can make any comments or ask any questions you like. Hmm. Well, we're exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> we can have an early minute if you like. Um, but um, um, if you think of anything, it's fine. So at this stage, I, I'll, um, um, I'll thank uh, Stephen very much. I, I found it really interesting. And uh, um, I hope you actually learned a lot from uh, doing all the research. Mm. Hmm. Yes, no, I did. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I certainly did. And uh, as I mentioned, when we had the rehearsal, uh, I do thank you for giving me some of the other historical uh, yeah, presentations that we've done in the past because I've certainly learned a lot, Eusebius and, and the others as well. Hmm. Okay, Dave. Uh, well, uh, now I'll just uh, start talking about um, what's coming up. Um, on um, Saturday, June the 18th, so what do, day is it today? It's, uh, is it the 9th? Yeah, 9th. So this is uh, nine days from now. We're having a meeting which is not in our regular time uh, on Thursday, every second for Thursday. Um, we're going to have um, uh, Dr. Hugh Ross of Reasons to Believe in America talk on climate change. So he's going to zoom in on one of our sessions and it's going to be held at 10, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, so Saturday morning on the 18th of July. And the reason South Australian time, isn't it? Yes, South Australian time. Uh, and the reason for that time is it's the same hour in California. It's going to be around about 10, 5.30 p.m. in Californian time. So we've had um, Dr. Ross speak to us before um, at um, um, our usual time of uh, 7 p.m. on a Thursday, but the poor fellow had to uh, be up between 1.30 a.m. and 3.30 a.m. in the morning, and uh, they had requested to change the time, but we, it was kind of locked in for us, and so they complied with that, but it was pretty unfair on, on Hugh Ross. So now we we decided to accommodate him, <laughs> so he can actually speak at a, a sensible t a time for him, and it's also a sensible time for us. So um, so uh, that's at 10 a.m. on Saturday the 18th. So put that in your calendar. I'll send you another reminder. Um, so he will provide a presentation on climate change, uh, the reason for the strange time of year. I've, I've already said that. But uh, he's going to cover the following top topics. Is climate change for real? And what can we do about it? So he uh, says, he, um, in a nutshell, he, he accepts that climate change is real, uh, but he's probably got uh, some novel uh, ways about saying what we can actually do about it and how it should uh, actually affect us. So background about him, uh, Hugh Ross is an astronomer or was an astronomer and astrophysicist at the University of Toronto. And he is a founder, founder and president of Reasons to Believe. And he's um, author of over 17 books, including The Creator and the Cosmos, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, Navigating Genesis. And uh, uh, so he's um, very much looking at scientific issues. And um, so uh, he's a big name in, in apologetics. And uh, he's addressed students and faculty on over 300 camp campuses in the US and abroad and speaks at various church churches and groups on a wide variety of science-based topics. So uh, he runs 
weekly meetings with skeptics and agnostics, and he's uh, asked to present at government agencies and atheists and leading contemporaries on the powerful evidence for a purposeful universe. Mm -hmm. So um, he's um, um, uh, quite an outstanding sort of person, so we're honoured to actually have him speak to us. Mm -hmm. And it'll be in a similar format to what we have today, so he'll speak for the first 50 minutes or so, and then he's open for questions and comments. Mm -hmm. Um, our next uh, normal meeting is um, uh, going to be presented by Gordon Stanger. And um, uh, we've got a title and a subtitle. Um, the title is called, Could the Author of Numbers Count? <laughs> and, um, uh, but the subtitle, and this is the one that Gordon suggested, was Have Hebrew Scholars Been Wrong These Last Few Millennia? And uh, Gordon, would you actually like to say anything about it at this stage? Um, well, as I'll keep most of my powder dry for the event, I think. But uh, basically, I'm not attacking the Bible in any way, but I am kind of I'm attacking anything. I'm attacking the, the misunderstanding, the misconstrued, the mistranslated aspects. There aren't many of them. Uh, there, there are actually two. One is the one I'm talking about, which is the uh, uh, the misunderstanding of, of uh, Elif, the um, the Hebrew word for a thousand, some say. Um, and the other one is the, the one you may be familiar with, which is uh, about Moses crossing the Red Sea, which actually was not the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. Um, and there's a lot of good evidence for that, that we've misunderstood a lot of what we've taught in traditional Sunday schools and things like that. Uh, I don't know whether I'll get round to the um, the Red Sea stuff. I could probably include it as well if you like. It's uh, that's not to do with numbers, but that's it's another case, another example where the English translation is <laughs> somewhat of an, an English mistranslation. Um, so. Uh, I'll probably get around to those two, I think. Yeah, uh, and um, just to skip a couple of meetings ahead of that too, uh, uh, Gordon's going to speak again uh, on the 27th of August on clim climate change driven migration. So I think that that will actually mesh in quite well with uh, Hugh Ross's talk. So <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll well, come to that later. <laughs> be interesting if there's a conflict of opinion, but yes. <laughs> Um, okay, don't, has anybody else got uh, any further that they'd like to say on the, the topic? If not, I'll stop the recording and just kind of have an informal uh, chat afterwards. So that's if I can find where my button is. Okay, don't. I'll stop the